For several decades, Morgan Freeman has enchanted audiences with his outstanding performances and endeared himself as one of the most beloved entertainers in modern American cinema. Born in 1937 in Memphis, Tennessee, Freeman had a brief career in the U.S. Air Force in the 1950s before turning to acting in the 1960s. In 1971, he was cast in his first big role as Easy Reader on The Electric Company, an educational children's TV show that he would eventually appear in 780 episodes of. Freeman made the shift into more dramatic and adult roles in the 1980s, highlighted by performances in classic films like Brubaker, Driving Miss Daisy, and The Shawshank Redemption. His first Oscar nomination came in 1988 for the film Street Smart, and he won the award in 2005 for his role in Million Dollar Baby. Freeman is one of the rare actors who has the range and depth to play everything from a Civil War soldier in glory, to a school principal in Lean on Me, to even civil rights hero Nelson Mandela in Invictus. Yet even though the actor has experienced some of the biggest highs that Hollywood can offer, his life has not been without tragedy. At a young age and throughout his life, Freeman has had to deal with racism at times, and he has also lost many loved ones, including one, to senseless and horrific violence. Still, the veteran screen star has managed to keep going and continue producing some of the most timeless movies ever, a testament to his incredible character. His meteoric rise to the top and sudden disappearance from the entertainment scene is one for the books, and it's one we have for you today. This is the story of Morgan Freeman and why you don't hear from him anymore. On June 1, 1937, Mamie Edna Revere Freeman and Morgan Porterfield Freeman Sr. welcomed their newest son, Morgan Freeman Jr., to the family. He was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and his parents moved north to Chicago when he was two years old, leaving him in the care of his grandmother in Mississippi. They moved to look for better economic prospects, as the South at that time was still soaked in legal racism, limiting their job opportunities. For the next four years, Morgan Jr. grew up in Mississippi at a time when Jim Crow laws were still on the books. Some of these laws included it being illegal to write about social equality between black and white residents, interracial marriage being illegal, and the educational system was also horribly unequal, too. In some school districts, the legislature deliberately underfunded schools that black children like Morgan Jr. attended, purposefully only giving them money to stay open for four months instead of the traditional nine. The school that Morgan Jr. attended in Greenwood, Mississippi, when he was six, was so underfunded that it only had one room. Freeman recalled that Mississippi was a society that was purposefully, obviously, openly segregated, but said his youthful ignorance partially insulated him from the realities of racism. Freeman would soon leave Jim Crow and move north, but his childhood in Mississippi certainly impacted his life. When the future Walk of Famer was just two years old, he came to live with his father's mother, Evelyn Freeman, in Charleston, Mississippi. For the next four years, Morgan lived at his grandmother's house with his older sister, Iris Virginia Freeman. He would still see his parents in Chicago during the summers, but every fall, he would always return to grandma's house to begin the school year anew. Sadly, that came to an end when Freeman was six and Evelyn passed away. Not only was he devastated by losing his grandmother, whom he was very close with, but her loss also portended even more anguish by making him move full-time to Chicago with his parents. Freeman hated the cold weather in Chicago, compared to the year-round warmth of Mississippi, and he also was not accustomed to the urban environment that differed so much from his rural upbringing in the Charleston countryside. In Chicago, Morgan's family lived in the neighborhood known as Bronzeville on the south side. Bronzeville had been the site of horrific violence just a few decades prior, during the race riots of the Red Summer of 1919, and it was relatively impoverished by the time the actor moved there in the 1940s. Freeman loved his time in Mississippi far more than in Chicago, mostly because he was around his grandma and had much more fun, and he may have never left it if not for her passing. As a teenager, Freeman spent some of his time in Mississippi, but one hot afternoon, he nearly got himself into a deadly predicament. As a teenager, Freeman spent some of his time in Mississippi, but one hot afternoon, he nearly got himself into a deadly predicament. 
He and his friend were hiking in the Mississippi Hills when they found a pond that promised to offer some relief from the pounding sun. The two of them jumped in, but Freeman had difficulty swimming, and as a result, he nearly drowned. Luckily, a few bystanders were able to grab a hold of him and drag him out of the water or else he probably would have died. Still, Freeman was far from okay. He was put in the hospital the next day after his condition did not improve, and they realized he was severely malnourished. Part of this was due to the impoverishment of his family, as he claimed to, at times, not have enough money to eat. For two weeks, Freeman had to stay in the hospital as he dealt with both pneumonia and an abscessed lung caused by the pond incident. His mother was there to help nurse him back to health, but it wore her out doing so. Freeman was only a teenager at the time and still in school, and the incident very nearly cost him his life. But thankfully, he was able to survive without any lifelong injuries or problems. But as he grew up, influenced by his environment, things slowly changed. I wouldn't say for the best, of course. Considering his persona, it might sound pretty far-fetched today, but Freeman was once in a street gang. His membership was the result of him growing up on Chicago's impoverished South Side, where violence was rampant and which he would refer to as an untenable situation. According to the actor, he had to do some initiations to get into the gang, which involved him committing some crimes. But his heart was never in it, and he abhorred the inherent violence of gang life. Gang life was so bad that Freeman, at times, wished that he was back in Mississippi, even if it meant dealing with the more overt racism of Jim Crow. According to Gina DeAngelis in Morgan Freeman, the name of Freeman's gang was the Spiders. He was a reluctant member who only joined because the gang offered protection in the rough-and-tumble Southside neighborhood he grew up in. Freeman was apparently not a full gang member, but did more than enough to be associated with them and earn their protection. If he had it his way, he would have just stuck to himself and minded his schoolwork. But that was not an option in his neighborhood. Fortunately for Freeman, he did not get caught committing any serious crimes, or his film career may have never had the chance to begin. But that's not the worst part of his life growing up. One of the most tragic parts of Morgan Freeman's childhood and young adulthood was his unfortunate relationship with Morgan Freeman Sr., his father, it was not until he was six years old, during Thanksgiving, that Morgan Jr. saw his father for the first time when he was home on leave from fighting in World War II. The meeting did not go well, and Morgan Jr. recalled his father being a mean man. This happened right around the time that the actor's grandmother died, which caused him to briefly move in with his father, who had returned from the army after he and Freeman's mother had gotten a divorce. The legendary actor called living with his father one of the really low points in his life, and he said that he never liked him. Things were so bad with his father that he only lived with him for six months before permanently moving back in with his mother and rarely seeing him afterward. The few times he did it was for a haircut. His dad was a barber, and to get a few dollars to give to his poor mother. But Morgan Jr. hated seeing him. His father eventually died in 1961, at the relatively young age of 47, from liver cirrhosis caused by years of excessive alcohol drinking. Young Morgan was only 24 years old when his father died, and the two never made amends or reconciled. When Freeman graduated high school, he initially turned down the opportunity to pursue his acting career, offered a scholarship to Jackson State University to join the theater program there. Freeman instead opted to go a completely different route and enlist in the U.S. Air Force. Joining the Air Force was a pragmatic decision by the future actor, who wanted to leave Mississippi and figured it would be a safer career path than acting. Most of his family were also veterans, which was another reason that spurred him to join, and he was in the service for just under four years. However, while Freeman had aspirations about being a jet fighter pilot, racism stood in his way. At the time that he was in the Air Force, the 1950s, racism was rampant, and it was still years before the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 ensured legal equality. Even though he did well and tested highly, Freeman was never able to advance above being a radar mechanic, and he has blamed not getting the chance to try out as a pilot on being black. In addition to being denied the opportunity to be a pilot, superiors would also make racist comments to him, like insinuating that black people were typically unkempt, 
Freeman ended up leaving the Air Force in 1959, just a few years before the U.S. entered the Vietnam War. Then, in the 1970s, while Freeman appeared to be on his way to superstardom after landing the role of Easy Rider on The Electric Company, his private life was not going so well. According to an interview the actor gave in 1989 with The Washington Post, while he enjoyed being on the show and liked the cast, it also caused him to descend briefly into alcoholism. He did not like the constant association he had with the show, where people would recognize him as Easy Rider, the character, rather than as Morgan Freeman, the actor. He went from drinking at lunch to bringing it home with him after he was done shooting, and martinis turned into scotch and whiskey. At one point, he was going through a few quarts of whiskey a week and was blacking out from drinking so much. In addition to the physical toll it was taking, the excessive drinking and unhappiness with the show also began to affect his marriage, which would later end in divorce in 1979. He quit drinking in the mid-1970s, just before The Electric Company stopped airing. Later in his career, Freeman was able to draw on his knowledge of being an alcoholic when he played a substance use counselor in the 1988 movie Clean and Sober. The actor has since replaced alcohol with marijuana, which has allowed him to continue his acting career. And while Morgan Freeman might be one of Hollywood's most successful and highest paid actors today, that was definitely not always the case. Early in his career, when he was just starting out, Freeman often had trouble earning enough money to make ends meet. While he was typically able to find a job, it was usually menial work that paid poorly, like a fast food restaurant gig where he wasn't even allowed to keep his tips. When things got really bad, even food became unaffordable, leaving him to starve for days unless he was able to get help from a friend. Asking for help was tough for the prideful Freeman, and he would resort to some less than savory meals in order to survive. This included combining milk and uncooked eggs together into a rough shake, which would somehow count as a meal. At least it offered some protein, according to Gina DeAngelis in Morgan Freeman. He occasionally had better paid jobs as an office worker, but this was unfulfilling for the driven Freeman, and he decided to pursue being an actor instead, going on unemployment instead of having a paycheck. Fast forward to August 3rd, 2008, Freeman suffered one of the worst moments of his life when he was involved in a serious car crash in Charleston, Mississippi. The actor was 71 at the time and immediately had to go to the hospital due to his injuries, which included a broken arm and elbow. He was lucky to have not been killed in the accident, during which his car reportedly rolled several times into a ditch. As a result of the accident, not only did Freeman have severe injuries, but the passenger in the car with him, Demaris Meyer, sued him over the crash. Meyer and Freeman settled the lawsuit out of court in 2009, and no details about the form of the settlement were released to the public. However, as a result of the crash, the actor was left with a lifelong injury to his right hand, known as fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a painful and chronic disorder that is not very well understood and does not have a cure. Freeman opened up about his struggles with the disorder in a 2012 interview with Esquire when he said the pain was excruciating and went up and down the arm. Personal tragedies didn't stop at that. Reportedly, the actor lost his granddaughter to a brutal murder. For many parents, their biggest fear is someday losing their child to some kind of horrific accident. And tragically, Freeman experienced just that when his step-granddaughter, Edina Hines, was brutally murdered in August 2015. Edina was Freeman's step-granddaughter by way of his first ex-wife, Jeanette Bradshaw, who was her grandmother before marrying Freeman. It was not until the actor was with his second wife, Myrna Colley Lee, that Edina moved in with them, at a time when her mother, Dina, was said to be struggling, and Freeman played a big role in raising her. However, on August 16, 2015, Edina's body was found with several stab wounds that her boyfriend, Lamar Davenport, had inflicted. She was pronounced dead later that morning at the hospital, and Davenport was arrested. Authorities later determined that Davenport was under the influence of the illicit drug fencyclidine, or PCP, when he killed Edina, and while he was acquitted of murder, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Freeman was understandably upset by her shocking death, and he released a statement to People magazine where he lamented her loss, saying, 
Her star will continue to shine bright in our hearts. Edina was 33 years old when Davenport killed her and had briefly worked as an actress, following in her step-grandfather's footsteps, however briefly. With all those series of unfortunate events and, of course, age catching up with him, Freeman hasn't been the once strong man all of us used to know. Besides, he has been struggling with several health issues, thus limiting his time to be active in the acting scene. The actor has also been riddled with controversies over the course of his long-running career, something that doesn't come as a surprise, given that level of stardom. In mid-2018, a scandal arose involving the veteran actor. A young production assistant thought she had landed the job of her dreams when, in the summer of 2015, she started to work on Going in Style, a bank heist comedy starring Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine, and Alan Arkin. Allegedly, the job quickly devolved into several months of harassment, she told CNN. She alleges that Freeman subjected her to unwanted touching and comments about her figure and clothing on a near daily basis. Freeman would rest his hand on her lower back or rub her lower back, she claimed. In one incident, she said, Freeman kept trying to lift up my skirt and asking if I was wearing underwear. He never successfully lifted her skirt, she said. He would touch it and try to lift it. She would move away, and then he'd try again. Eventually, she said, Alan made a comment telling him to stop. Morgan got freaked out and didn't know what to say. According to other sources who spoke to CNN, the actor's alleged inappropriate behavior was not limited to that one movie set. A woman who was a senior member of the production staff of the movie Now You See Me in 2012 told CNN that Freeman S. Yuley harassed her and her female assistant on numerous occasions by making comments about their bodies. He did comment on our bodies. We knew that if he was coming by, not to wear any top that would show our breasts, not to wear anything that would show our bottoms, meaning not wearing clothes that were fitted, she said. At 86 years old, Freeman is one of Hollywood's biggest stars, with a movie career that spans nearly five decades. His starring roles in movies like Driving Miss Daisy and Shawshank Redemption in the late 1980s and early 1990s made him a household name. As mentioned earlier, he won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for 2004's Million Dollar Baby and has earned four other Oscar nominations. His voiceover work has also become iconic, including his narration for the Academy Award-winning documentaries The Long Way Home and March of the Penguins. In all, 16 people spoke to CNN about Freeman as part of this investigation, eight of whom said they were victims of what some called harassment and others called inappropriate behavior by Freeman. Eight said they witnessed the actor's alleged conduct. These 16 people together described a pattern of inappropriate behavior by Freeman on set while promoting his movies and at his production company, Revelations Entertainment. Of those 16, seven people described an environment at Revelations Entertainment that included allegations of harassment or inappropriate behavior by Freeman there, with one incident allegedly witnessed by Lori McCreary, Freeman's co-founder in the Enterprise, and another in which she was the target of demeaning comments by Freeman in a public setting. One of those seven people alleged that McCreary made a discriminatory remark regarding a female candidate for a job at the Producers Guild of America, where McCreary is co-president. Four people who worked in production capacities on movie sets with Freeman over the last 10 years described him as repeatedly behaving in ways that made women feel uncomfortable at work. Two, including the production assistant on Going in Style, whose skirt he allegedly attempted to lift, said Freeman subjected them to unwanted touching. Three said he made public comments about women's clothing or bodies, but each of them said they didn't report the actor's behavior, with most saying it was because they feared for their jobs. Instead, some of the women, both on movie sets and at Revelations, said they came up with ways to combat the alleged harassment on their own such as by changing the way they dressed when they knew he would be around. CNN reached out to dozens more people who worked for or with Freeman. Some praised the actor, saying they never witnessed any questionable behavior or that he was a consummate professional on set and in the office. Several other times during the investigation, when a CNN reporter contacted a person who had worked with Freeman to try to ask them if they had seen or been subjected to inappropriate behavior by an actor they had worked with. 
Not initially even naming the actor they were asking about, the person would immediately tell them they knew exactly who the reporter had in mind, Morgan Freeman. Some of those people were sources for this investigation, while others declined to comment further or did not want what they said to be used in the story. Despite all of that, Freeman emerged, proved his innocence, and got back to work, with one of his latest projects paying homage to one of his most desired gifts, his voice. Freeman's rich, majestic voice has graced a number of documentaries over the years about religion, Jewish refugees, and even penguins. His next one has a scope and subject that befit a man popularly known as the voice of God, the entire history of life on Earth. Life on Our Planet, an eight-part series on Netflix, takes viewers through billions of years, beginning at the dawn of time, starting with single cells in a primordial soup and sweeping through the age of the dinosaurs and the development of human civilization, the series charts the rise and fall of countless species. As Freeman narrates, the show depicts the great battles for survival and the dynasties that would take over the world. Produced by Silverback Films in association with Steven Spielberg's Amblin Television, the show relies on visual effects to conjure up lifelike prehistoric creatures, including woolly mammoths, a four-winged dinosaur called the Antiornis, and of course the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Visual effects make up 30 to 40 percent of each episode. The remainder consists of footage shot in 45 countries, including Ecuador, Ivory Coast, Morocco, and the United Kingdom. Despite the show's title, this planetary saga frequently dwells on death. In scene after scene, predators stalk their prey. A flying reptile swoops down on an unsuspecting sea turtle, a crocodile eyes a wildebeest, and a squid pounces on a shrimp. The hunt's charged with suspense by Freeman's booming voice. The shrimp never saw it coming, he says as the squid enjoys its meal. Death also comes to entire species, with the show's narrative punctuated by five mass extinctions that together kill off millions of creatures. Each event destroys one group of animals and paves the way for another, progressing from invertebrates to dinosaurs and eventually to mammals. Freeman, an Academy Award winner, hopes viewers stick around long enough to see the end of the series when the show depicts the ascendance of humans, the only species capable of bringing about its own mass extinction. It was said that God created the heavens and the earth and put man in control, Freeman said in an interview. That's a big mistake if God actually did that because in just a few million years, we've almost created another extinction-level event. In a phone interview from his home in Mississippi, Freeman spoke about the roots of his unmistakable vocal style, his admiration for David Attenborough, and his fears about our planet's future. Ultimately, from his early roles to his iconic performances, Freeman has left an indelible mark on the world of cinema. One of his most memorable roles is that of Red in The Shawshank Redemption, a film that has achieved cult status and is often cited as one of the greatest movies of all time. Freeman's portrayal of the wise and introspective inmate earned him critical acclaim and solidified his reputation as a masterful actor. In Driving Miss Daisy, Freeman delivered a nuanced and heartfelt performance as Hoke Colburn, a chauffeur who forms a deep bond with his employer played by Jessica Tandy. The film not only showcased Freeman's acting prowess, but also tackled important themes of race and friendship. His portrayal of God in the comedy film Bruce Almighty brought a touch of humor and wisdom to the character, earning him praise for his ability to infuse even the most fantastical roles with a sense of authenticity. Whether he is playing a hardened detective, a supportive mentor, or a divine being, one thing is clear. Morgan Freeman's talent shines through in every role he undertakes. His versatility, charisma, and commitment to his craft have made him a beloved figure in the world of entertainment, and his iconic performances continue to captivate audiences around the globe. When it comes to the world of Hollywood, few names resonate with as much reverence and admiration as that of Freeman. His presence on screen is nothing short of magnetic, drawing viewers in with an irresistible charm and a commanding presence that is uniquely his own. But what is it exactly that sets Freeman apart from his peers? One of the defining characteristics of Freeman's talent is his incredible versatility. 
Whether he's portraying a wise mentor, a hardened detective, or a charismatic leader, Freeman effortlessly embodies each role with a level of authenticity and depth that is truly unmatched. His ability to inhabit a character and breathe life into every word and gesture is a testament to his exceptional skill as an actor. Moreover, Freeman's voice is a force unto itself, with a rich timbre and a soothing cadence that has become iconic in its own right. His narration has the power to captivate audiences and imbue even the simplest of words with profound meaning, making him the go-to choice for documentaries, commercials, and film voiceovers. Beyond his acting prowess and distinctive voice, Morgan Freeman exudes a quiet charisma that draws people to him. Whether he's on screen or off, the veteran actor possesses a natural magnetism that commands attention and leaves a lasting impression on all who encounter him. In essence, what sets Morgan Freeman apart is not just his talent as an actor, but the enigmatic aura that surrounds him. He is a true master of his craft, a living legend whose presence on screen is nothing short of magical. Aside from his acting and vocal talents, Freeman's commitment to social and environmental causes has cemented his status as a respected figure in philanthropy. His involvement in organizations promoting education, racial equality, and environmental sustainability highlights his dedication to making a positive impact on the world around him. By using his platform to raise awareness and support meaningful causes, Freeman has inspired others to follow in his footsteps and create positive change in their communities. Through his work both on and off the screen, Freeman has crafted a legacy that transcends the boundaries of Hollywood stardom. His influence and contributions serve as a testament to the transformative power of talent, empathy, and dedication, inspiring generations to come to make a difference in the world around them. In a world where celebrity status often comes with its fair share of controversies and scandals, Morgan Freeman stands out as a beacon of integrity and authenticity. His enduring appeal lies not just in his remarkable talent, but in the depth of character and humanity that he brings to every role he undertakes. As fans continue to be captivated by his performances, Morgan Freeman remains a timeless icon whose enigmatic talent will continue to inspire and resonate for years to come. And that's it from us today until next time. Thank you for watching.